Welcome to the first week of U.S. government. Uh, yesterday you created your own governments in a group or individually, depending on when you're starting in the quarter. And now we're going to be taking some Cornell notes on why should we even study government. If you are unfamiliar with Cornell notes or you need a refresher, I do have a video posted to Google Classroom that can give you a review. Um, so watch that first if you need to, but otherwise we're going to go ahead and start the notes. So first thing I want you to write down in your notes is what is your definition of government? What do you think it means for there to be a government? And also, why is government necessary? So go ahead and write that down in your note somewhere. Actually answer the question. Don't just write the question. And remember, because this is a video, you can pause it any time that you need to in order for you to have more time. So if we look at the formal definition of government, a government is an organized system of rule over a community or a state. Now in a government class, we study the system of rule over a community or a state. And in government class, we also study the relationship and interaction between our government and the people. We'll be doing this with the three branches of our government in the U.S., legislative, executive, and judicial. So that's going to be how do we interact with our president, with our Supreme Court judges, how do their decisions affect us, and how can we affect their decisions as well. So why do we study government? Well, we study government for a number of reasons. First, to become informed citizens. You've got to be able to know how your government works in order to contribute to it and know how it might affect you in the short term or long term. So by becoming informed citizens in an effort to understand our country so that we can intellectually take part in the democratic process. Okay, so that might look like participating and voting in the elections. Okay, in other words, you need to be aware enough to make smart, sensible decisions in society and not rely on others to decide for you. Okay, so it's not just enough to just go out and vote, you gotta actually research and know what it is you're voting on and how your decisions are going to affect the rest of our country and society. We tend to learn a lot from our parents and our families, which is why, you know, we might be influenced by others. They might try to get us to decide something based on what they think. But the goal is that you can make your own educated decisions on what you think. You're going to learn a lot of other things too besides just about U.S. government. You're going to learn a multitude of perspectives. You're going to learn critical thinking skills, how to interpret a variety of sources in discerning bias. You're going to make connections that unite people economically and politically throughout the world and throughout history and the ways in which we are divided. As you go through the course, you might find that you develop other important values and skills along the way. So governments can try to create a more just and better society. That's often their goal. But you always want to be thinking about who is this society going to be better for? Is it better for everyone or is it sometimes better for just certain groups of people? Okay. Off to the left, we have George Washington, their first president of the United States, crossing the Delaware during the Revolutionary War. Very famous painting. Now, take a moment, jot down some ideas in your notes. Who 
was benefiting the most when our founding fathers decided to start their own government in the United States? What was their purpose for doing that? Who was going to benefit from the new government? So an example of who our own United States government, when it was initially founded, is not going to benefit, who it wasn't designed for, was slaves. Okay, On the right is a portrait, um, a photograph of a runaway slave named Peter from 1863. You can see the markings on his back where he was whipped because he was caught after running away. So, obviously, this new government, which is supposed to increase and give us a more democratic society within the United States, give people a voice, it wasn't for everyone. It wasn't for slaves. It wasn't for women or necessarily even children. It was for the middle to upper class white men. Now, while governments don't always affect everyone in a positive way, they can make some positive interventions as well, okay? And by interventions, I mean they step up and they try to fix something or make something better. We saw this happen with the Great Depression in the early 1900s with FDR's New Deal. They created a variety of welfare programs that were meant to help various types of people through the struggles of the Great Depression, the Great Depression was an economic downturn or recession, so money was really tight. A lot of people were unemployed, didn't have a way to support themselves or feed their families, so the government tried to create jobs. They offered various welfare pro uh, programs as well. Now, not all government interventions are going to be good. Sometimes they're going to be harmful to people. An example of this was during World War II with Japanese internment. So when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, it sparked fear within the U.S. about the Japanese people. And what the government did is to supposedly prevent spies uh, within the U.S. of Japanese Americans they rounded everyone up and basically put them in prison camps throughout the U.S., especially on the West Coast and our coastlines, um, against their will. They had no choice in the matter. Many of them were American citizens. Many of them had been born in the U.S. and should have had full and complete rights as an American citizen. Uh, but the government violated this with the idea that it was to protect the U.S., okay? But it was not protecting the Japanese people, or not even Japanese people, I mean Japanese Americans, who, like I said, had been leaving in the U.S. for anywhere from years to having been born and raised here. So, and it affected them for many, many years after internment, and even still today, because when they were forced into these prison camps, you can see the picture on the right, there's barbed wire, there were armed guards, very crowded situation, okay? They did not have a lot of options, they were taken out of school, um, many of them lost their properties and the businesses that they had owned, and they never got it back. So what I want you to go ahead and do now is on Google Classroom, you're going to be answering a quick write. The quick write should be one paragraph. I want five good, solid, complete sentences, okay? You think, oh, there's five sentences, but you're going to be giving me examples and evidence for your reasoning, which is going to help you get to those five sentences, okay? So the question you're going to be answering is, do people have the same experience living under their government? Okay. Do all people have the same experience living under their government? You can use the U.S. government. You can use another country that maybe you're familiar with. But go ahead, pause the video, take a moment, and answer that question on Google Classroom.
once you're done with the quick write, make sure you come back to the video because your notes are going to continue. So, what you probably thought of, maybe not, but many of you probably decided that, you know what, not all people are necessarily treated the same under their government. There may be a goal to have equality, but it doesn't always quite pan out. And we're going to look at some examples of this. So in the United States, we often have pay inequities, meaning people aren't always paid the same. And we also have inequities within incarceration rates. So that means the type of people, the ethnicities of people who are going to prison more often. Okay, so right here, we're showing the lifetime likelihood of imprisonment. This is from 2003. So keep that in mind. It could have changed a little bit, but not a whole lot. We have just all men in general. Okay, one in nine men are likely to be imprisoned. Out of women, it's only one in 56. So we have a disparity in the number of men and for compared to women um, across all ethnicities. So as a social scientist or a historian, you want to be thinking about why is that? Why are men more likely to go to prison compared to women? What might be some reasons for that? Then we kind of break it down in a few different ethnicities. We have white men, 1 in 17. White women, 1 in 111. Black men are 1 in 3 chances of being imprisoned in their lifetime. Latino men is 1 in 6. Black women is 1 in 18. And Latino women is 1 in 45. So big difference across the different ethnicities. We have the gender pay gap off to the right. So for every dollar a man would make, white women make 77 cents. Black women, 69 cents for every dollar a man makes. And Latino women make 57 cents for every dollar a man makes. Hourly pay grows even more unequal. If you look at blacks in 1979, made $16.07 an hour. Only went up to $18.49. So this is the averages. Okay. And they've been adjusted for inflation. So were they actually making $16 in 1979? No, it was less than that. But if you compare inflation, that would be the comparable amount. Okay, Whites were making $19.62 uh, $19 an hour in 1979. But in 2015, they were making closer to $25.22. So again, a good size difference between the two, almost six whole dollars. All people have equal rights before the law. Do all people have them? So if you look at other rates, you can look at um, how many um, different ethnicities are more likely to be killed by police. It's three times uh, black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than a white person. Okay. And um, that's per one million people. 30% of black victims are found to be unarmed, okay, when they looked at the data in 2015, compared to only 19% of white victims. And it's not always violent crimes that this is happening, this disparity. It's often also nonviolent or unarmed crimes, okay, off to the top Right, fewer than one in three black people were killed by police in America this year, were suspected of a violent crime and allegedly armed. Okay, so that means that one in three that were killed were not suspected of a violent crime. It was a non-violent crime, and they were still killed. Now, there isn't a whole lot of accountability. 97% of cases in 2015 did not result in any officers involved being charged with a crime. Okay. 